This is Eric. I'm going to talk about making heat maps in QGIS. Heat maps are useful for showing the density of points mostly in a map. So in a situation like this one, this is just um, this is graffiti reports in New York City. It's so dense that you can't see all of the points. You can zoom in and you still have these clusters where it's hard to see all of the points, even pretty far in. And when you're zoomed out like this, the points look roughly like they have a uniform distribution. It looks basically the same amount dense here as it does up here. Um, so heat maps can kind of help you bring out the differences in density throughout your map. That will be a little bit more clear once I create a heat map. So here we go. Um, there's a heat map plugin. It might be installed by default depending on your QGIS. You might have to enable it by searching for heat map and clicking this checkbox. Once you've enabled it, you should be able to go up to raster in the toolbar and find heat map. And then there's just a heat map item in there. Here you have to specify your input points. Remember, this is only going to work with points. If you have small polygons that you want to turn into a heat map, you could first create those centroids for those. Otherwise, we're just going to go with these points that are already loaded here. And you're going to want to specify a place for those to go. The For the heat map to go, I'm overwriting something that I already had written to. And um, we know that our map units are feet right now because the projection that I'm using is in feet. So I'm going to use map units because it's a little bit easier to think about um, feet. So I'm going to use a radius of 2,000 feet in this case. The What the radius is useful for, for will come up in a second. But in the meantime, I'm just going to create the heat map. OK. So what we have is a grayscale heat map currently. Black is the least density, and white is the most density, except for my background color here. I can, I'm not going to change the background color for now. Actually, um, why don't I? turn on a base layer so you can see this a little bit better. So I'm going to use the Open Layers plugin and I'll bring in Toner. And I'm going to put it under the heat map. Okay. Um, right. So these black areas have the least probable density and the as it gets grayer and then whiter, they are the most, that's where graffiti is most likely to be reported. Um, how these are colored might be mysterious to you if you've never used a raster data source in QGIS. First, I'm going to use the Identify Features tool and make sure that my heat map is selected. I'm going to click on these just so you can see. Um, the value here is it's just a number associated with each pixel. So I clicked on one of the darker areas and you can see if you're watching the value here, it's pretty low. It's 0 0.005. Um, if I pick further out, it's just zero. If I click somewhere totally outside of the heat map, it says no data. Uh, but these very, very edges, you should get zero or something close to it. 
And like I said, as you get to the grayer areas, that number goes up 0.26, and here 1.2. These numbers are pretty um, meaningless as far as your map goes. You wouldn't want to tell the user that that value is 1 there. But it's, it's telling you relative from, uh, from a darker point to a grayer point to a whiter point, relatively how, how dense they are. And um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and colorize this. You can do that by double clicking on the layer. Let me do that again. I did that kind of quickly. So the, the heat map layer is right here. I'm going to double click on it. And that brings up the properties for this layer. And if the style tab isn't selected, go ahead and stop. click that. The render type, currently we're in grayscale. That's why it's in black and white. If we could move over to pseudo color, we can colorize this in a way pretty similar to how you would do it with a choropleth map. I'm going to go with um, an orange red. So orange will be the the least likely areas and red will be the most likely areas. And when I classify that and apply it, you see the result. Okay, so let's let's go back and think about the the radius that I that I glossed over earlier. The radius is actually the radius from each point. Um, the radius is used in each pixel of this raster image. The radius is used to determine the value that that pixel should get. So for this pixel here, this this little bump right here, it used a search radius of 2,000 feet because we used a 2,000 feet uh, radius for this heat map. And it found one point, so it got a very low value. It was also pretty far from that point, so it got an even lower value. And um, if you look somewhere like in here, for these pixels, it, the plugin found many points nearby and probably closer by, so that these pixels got higher values. And that's why the numbers, you can't say too much about what the numbers really mean. Okay. So why don't we look at making the radius bigger so you get an idea of what that actually really means for your heat map. So I'm going to go ahead to raster, heat map, heat map. I'm going to pick a different location, this time two. And all I'm going to do in this one is double the radius to 4,000 feet. I'm still not going to touch advanced, and I'll hit OK. And let me stylize this exactly the way I was doing the other one. So I'm using orange red. For some reason, it's not coming up. I'm not sure why that is. Let's try that again. Oh, I forgot to classify it. Duh. All right. So now when I turn this on, you see that it's fuzzier a bit. Because the radius is bigger, the pixels out here that weren't getting any value at all in our first heat map, they get values, but they're really low because they're pretty far out there. So on top right now, I have the second heat map that we made. That's the one with twice the radius. And underneath that, I have the one with 2,000 foot radius. You can see the difference. I think um, 
choosing your radius is going to depend on the data source you're using and how how dense that data is and what you want the resulting heat map to look like. I think in this case it's pretty clear that the smaller radius is a bit more effective. I don't like how the bigger radius kind of just covers Staten Island uniformly and you lose a lot of resolution in the dense parts here in the middle specifically you lose a lot of a lot of detail in there and also further further north you lose it just feels like things are bleeding together in an unhelpful way this might work if you were doing something larger scale a bit more zoomed out um, but if you were doing something more at the neighborhood level definitely want a smaller radius Okay, and that's mostly what you're going to end up doing for a heat map. Let's hide the second one. Um, but before I move on, I want to show you some of the advanced settings that I skipped over. So let's make another heat map. This time I'll use 2000 map units again, two, and I'll search. I'll make it number three. Okay, and for the advanced settings, you actually have to click the checkbox. And so, rows and columns and these cell sizes, these are all interrelated. If you change one of these, the rest will change. So if I bump this up a little bit, you see the other three fields change. Same with this one. If I move it back down, the rest go back down because they're all proportional. Um, the rows and columns are actually the number of row pixels, so we only have 500 pixels going up and about 511 columns going from west to east, and the size of those pixels in map units changes depending on how many of these pixels we have. So if we make, if we make it so that there are a lot of pixels, then those cells get a lot smaller. Maybe if we, maybe we don't want to double the rows, but we could go to 450, say. They were at, um, wait, they were at 500? So let's make it bigger, 650. Okay, that covers those four fields. This field, the kernel shape, is that determines the the way that a nearby point affects the pixel as it's going through this algorithm. So what that means is sometimes for different shapes, some of these are going to give higher values to pixels that are far away than others. And it's really about um, how much does closeness count and how much does farther away count from a pixel. So maybe um, if you want very defined hotspots within your heat map, you might want it to drop off very steeply so that the cells that are further from your points get less value, so they are going to be in a, a lower class when you classify them. These these five kernel shapes are um, maybe best looked at using a graphic, and this graphic actually includes a bunch of others, but, but the, they give you an idea of the shape that you'll be getting. A triangle is just going to slant lines both sides. So remember, the middle is the actual point that you're for your in, from your input points, and off to the sides is the distance from that point that the cell is that you're looking at. So if 
the cell that I'm trying to color in is out here. For all of them, it's going to get about this value, but say, if it's this far away, it's going to get a much lower value with tri weight. And this decay ratio is one that you can only use with, I think it's with triangular. So that kind of, that's going to change the slope of these lines. You could have them be very steep, or you could have them be much less steep with, by changing that ratio. I'm not going to mess with that right now. You can also make your radius dynamic based on an integer field or a number field in your data. So each point will have a different radius if you do that. And similarly, you can give a weight to each point and that weight in turn gives more weight to the cells nearby. So the cells nearby will get more emphasis. Things will look more dense in areas with a higher weight. And the weight field might be um, a number that is, say, um, if this was if this included, say, a cleanup fee for the graffiti, you might want to weight the graffiti that way. And then instead of showing just a density map of locations that were reported, you'd actually be seeing how much damage they were causing. OK, I'm going to classify that the same way I've been doing the rest. Don't forget that classify button. So what changed here? It's a little bit higher res. Higher resolution. There are more cells. So if we turn off the old heat map and turn it on, it's pretty close. Remember, all I did was increase the number of cells a bit. Sorry. <laughs> Might help to zoom in a bit. So the most recent one is on top. You can see the pixels here. And as I when I turn that off, you can see that the pixels get bigger and the re resolution's a bit lower on the old one. So if you want nicer resolution, you also see that the shapes get are going to change based on the number of pixels in your image. Um, you'll want to watch out for that, but it does get it's a little bit nicer to look at when you have more rows and columns. Okay, so that is how you make heat maps in QGIS. Hope you find it useful and have fun.